Welcome back to the programme this morning. Uh, now let's get back to our top story this morning. Theresa May uh, has won the support of her cabinet for a draft Brexit agreement. But it's just the first stage in the approval process to discuss what lies ahead. I'm joined uh, by our correspondent Alistair Sanford in the studio. Good morning, Alistair. Good morning, Belle. Let's assume for a moment that Theresa May does manage to hold on as uh, Prime Minister. Uh, she then needs to get this draft agreement through Parliament. What are the numbers involved in that? It's not yes, too easy, is it? this is the famous meaningful vote. And on the face of it, she really does have an uphill struggle. Let's start with the current state of Parliament and the number of MPs, 650. How many does Theresa May need to get that vote passed? Now, we can take out a certain number who won't be voting. There's a handful of Sinn Féin uh, seats. Uh, they're the Irish nationalists who don't sit at Westminster. They won't be there. Also the Speaker and his deputies. Now, the calculations are that the Prime Minister would need 320 to get over the line. Is she going to get that? Her government, of course, as we can see from the chart in Parliament, is in a very pre precarious position. It only governs thanks to the support of the uh, Democratic Unionists in Northern Ireland, the DUP. They have 10 MPs at Westminster. They vehemently opposed any plan that would separate Northern Ireland from Great Britain. The opposition parties are lining up against it. Labour, uh, the main opposition party, have said they'll vote against. The Scottish nationalists uh, are likely to do the same. Uh, the Liberal Democrats from the other side of the political divide, they want an exit from Brexit and a second referendum. Add to all that the turmoil in the Conservatives' own ranks, strong opposition, means that that big chunk of blue is likely to shrink uh, quite significantly. The group of Eurosceptic MPs is several dozen strong. They've been very vocal. And also, of course, there are pro-EU MPs who also say uh, they want to vote against the deal because it would leave the UK worse off, they believe, than it has been in the EU. All right, so if we think, you know, it's a lot of plates spinning up in the air, essentially waiting to see where those uh, fall. Do we have any, indica any indication of where they might fall? What might happen Well, next? the comments we've had since last night uh, suggest there's very little change. Very little change. Uh, the early reaction to the deal has been very hostile. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, confirmed what he'd said earlier in this tweet. This is a bad deal which isn't in the interests of the whole country. Uh, the Democratic Unionist leader, Arlene Foster, she doesn't say outright she'll vote against. She met the, uh, uh, Theresa May in Downing Street last night. She says we had, a very, uh, we had a frank meeting with the PM lasting about an hour. She's fully aware of our position and concerns. Now, amongst the conservative Eurosceptics, there's no indication that their views have changed. Jacob Rees-Mogg, for instance, said it's a pretty rotten deal. For an illustration of the strength of feeling, let's listen to another MP uh, earlier yesterday, before the Cabinet met, uh, this was Peter Bone challenging the Prime Minister in Parliament. You are not delivering the Brexit people voted for. And today you will lose the support of many Conservative MPs and millions of voters across the country. Now, there's been similar hostility, too, from the pro-Europeans uh, amongst Conservative ranks who've been indicated also that they uh, will vote against. So does that mean, well, is it lost in advance? Where can the other votes come from for Theresa May? There may be some Labour MPs, particularly from Leave voting constituencies, who want to deliver on the referendum and fear that they'll get no Brexit at the end of this, but their numbers are thought to be relatively small, perhaps just 15. What we can see now is the government mounting a fierce campaign. Uh, Theresa May will be hoping for momentum behind the deal. Uh, she certainly wants to avoid more cabinet resignations, which could be fatal. She'll be hoping to get business on board, perhaps positive reaction from the markets. As she says, what's the alternative? No deal or no Brexit. Now, that's a stark choice that is likely to concentrate minds. Many people might be put off by the possibility of, uns well, certain of uncertainty and potential chaos that may follow a no vote. Equally, passions are aroused here and people all on all sides, they say this is not just the short term, this is the long term future of the country. And so party whips are going to have their work cut out for them. Thank you very much, uh, Alistair Sanford there in the studio with us. First, resignation uh, that we've had uh, this morning uh, on the back of, of these latest Brexit developments. Vincent, tell us what's going on in London. Good morning, Belle. That's right. We've had the first resignation from government. It is the Northern Irish Minister, Shalesh Vara. He has quit 
this morning and sent a letter to the Prime Minister just to explain in the UK government, in the Cabinet you have the Secretaries of State responsible for all the different areas of the state and under them you normally have around two or three ministers who work for them in their department. So this isn't someone who was in the Cabinet meeting yesterday, a Secretary of State, this is just the rank below that within government but still this could be the start of a wave of resignations. Now I've just got his uh, resignation letter sent to me and just to take you through it. He says the referendum offered a simple choice, either to stay or leave the EU. The result was decisive for the UK. The agreement put forward, though, leaves the UK in a halfway house with no time limit on when we finally become a sovereign nation. He talks about a halfway house. He talks about the separate deal for Northern Ireland and the threat that would leave to the integrity of the UK. But he also, I think, is a phrase to pull out. He says at the end, we are a proud nation and it is a sad day when we are reduced to obeying rules made by other countries who have shown they do not have our best interests at heart. He signs off saying it's been an honour to serve in the government, but this is a pretty damning letter. It shows that uh, someone well abreast of the issues in Northern Ireland, as a Northern Ireland minister, thinks that this is going to cause problems there with this new special arrangement designed to avoid the backstop, a hard border, either between the Republic and Northern Ireland or in the Irish Sea. He seems to think this is going to cause trouble. And it's an issue, Bell, we've talked about for weeks, Northern Ireland, what to do. The province itself actually voted to remain in the EU. It was like Scotland. It wanted to stay. It knew that there would be significant problems with that border, with the relationship with Ireland. People always fearful of going back to the past, of breaking the Good Friday Agreement and all the troubles that could be reflared. So it's interesting now that this is the first minister to go, one who has a very specific reason because of Northern Ireland. But we'll see now whether any more ministers or any more secretaries of state, the more senior level, the more critical level for May, decide to make a move. Michel Barnier has said the draft Brexit withdrawal deal can be the start of an ambitious new partnership between the EU and the UK. The EU's chief spokesperson uh, said the draft document was a fair and balanced agreement. He made his comments just a short while ago at a joint press conference with the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk. What we have agreed at negotiators' level is fair and balanced takes into account the UK's positions, organises the withdrawal in an orderly fashion and ensure no hard border on the island of Ireland and lays the ground for an ambitious new partnership. Oh, that uh, was uh, Michel Barnier speaking there. And in a minute, we'll be having the view from Brussels, from Westminster and from our political editor, uh, Darren McCaffrey in Strasbourg. Uh, but first, let's cross to Shona in Brussels. Uh, good morning to you, Shona. Uh, we've heard there a little taste of what Michel Barnier uh, had to say. Just give us a fuller picture of what, uh, of what Barnier and, in fact, Donald Tusk were saying. Indeed. Well, we heard from President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, who confirmed that if nothing extraordinary happens between now and then, there would be a European Council meeting on the 25th of November at 9.30 a.m., convening the, uh, uh, the member states to give their imprimatur to this withdrawal agreement. Um, it's, it'll be a seminal moment in European history. It'll be the first time that a, a member state has left the European Union. Donald Tusk um, gets quite emotional when it comes to Brexit, and he said, that while he was sad to see the UK leave the European Union, he'd do his best to make sure this farewell was as painless as possible. And that's what we heard from him. He also made the point that there's still a long road ahead, still a lot of negotiations. But to give you an idea of the timeline, he, sa he made the point that by Tuesday there should be an agreement on the political declaration. This is a non-binding declaration, or non-legally binding, I should say. And we give an outline of what both sides hope to see in the future relationship. That's another part of this, this next part of this uh, Brexit saga, which will continue on after Brexit happens in March of next year. But as Michel Barnier said last night, and you, and you mentioned it there, um, this uh, withdrawal agreement uh, with the UK-wide customs backstop will give something of an outline of what the future relationship will look like. Um, Donald Tusk also paid tribute to the extraordinary hard work, the exceptional hard work uh, put in by Michel Barnier, the 
lead negotiator for the EU27 member states. Mr Barnier uh, said that everybody remained scrupulously within the mandate given to him by member states. And perhaps that's the reason why this has gone uh, quite well for the European Union with regard to unity. I mean, there's no uh, word of any dissent from any member states or anyone in the European Parliament regarding this deal. There seems to be a unified position that this is the best that could possibly be. I think they wait with bated breath as to see what will happen in, um, in the UK. Uh, also, uh, Donald Trust made the point that this is a lose-lose situation, but this withdrawal agreement would do the utmost to damage or to limit the damage that was going to be done by Brexit. The, you know, all sides really are still of the opinion that Brexit is a bad thing uh, in general for the UK, for the European Union, and they'll never move away from that idea. But I think that they're coming to terms with the fact that if, if, um, if everything goes ahead, if Theresa May maintains this uh, level of support that she has within Cabinet and is able to get the arithmetic right in Westminster, then November 25th will be D-Day uh, for the European Union and for the UK and for that withdrawal agreement to be rubber stamped by member states, all 28 member states.